In this video, we're going to look at Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, also known as hybrid Monte Carlo. In the previous video, we looked at the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, where we explored the state space by taking random walks based on a proposal distribution. The challenge is that the efficiency of this exploration depends heavily on the variance of that proposal. If the variance is too large, we take big jumps that let us cover ground quickly but most of those jumps land in regions of very low probability, so they get rejected. If the variance is too small, we accept almost everything, but we creep through the state space at a painfully slow pace. So we're stuck balancing between moving too fast and getting rejected, or moving too slow and not exploring enough. What we need is a sweet spot somewhere in between. What I've shown you here is in 2D, in higher dimensions, this problem only gets worse. We also saw the Gibbs algorithm, which takes steps according to the conditionals in an axis-aligned fashion. We saw that here we have several problems, for example if we have separated islands of probability. But the Gibbs can also be very slow to traverse narrow regions of probability, at least when they are not axis-aligned. What we would want is to somehow take the shape of the target distribution into consideration when proposing new steps. The way to do that is by using the gradient of the unnormalized target PDF. And so this is the reason why these methods are sometimes referred to as gradient methods. And there are a few gradient methods, but we'll focus on one of them called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is mainly based on these two papers over here. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo not only incorporates gradient information, but also allows us to traverse the distribution quickly, as we shall see now. The first step is to apply a negative log transformation to the distribution. This lets us reinterpret it as a physical surface that we can model in terms of potential and kinetic energy. Regions where f of x is high map to valleys in this surface, areas of low potential energy in negative log f of x. We assume the system is frictionless, so a ball placed on the surface would always conserve its total energy and trace out the same trajectory span. Let's see this in action. In this animation, we start with the target distribution and transform it using the negative log. Next, we place a ball at some point on this surface. If we release it, and assuming there is no friction, this is the path the ball would take as it moves through the system. The second step is to sample a nudge. So, in each step of the algorithm, instead of proposing a new position, we are going to propose a new nudge. This nudge corresponds to kinetic energy or momentum. One way I look at it is that if we were to sample a new position, this would be equal to a nudge in a flat surface system with friction. But instead we are sampling a nudge in curved space without friction. The third step is to solve the dynamics of the system. This simply means to understand how the ball will move through time. So we have some initial potential energy, the position, and initial kinetic energy, the nudge. The evolution of these quantities is governed by the Hamiltonian, which describes how the system's total energy behaves. In an ideal frictionless setup, total energy is conserved. It's always the sum of potential and kinetic energy. So when potential energy is high, kinetic energy must be low. And when potential is low, kinetic rises to compensate. In this animation, you can see how both the state x and the momentum m change as the ball is moving through the negative log f of x, which is denoted here as capital P of x. P stands for potential. You can see the momentum is highest when P of x is lowest, and vice versa. And here's another animation that starts with a nudge of m. See how the dynamics of the system is different from the one before. The ball moves in a much greater span. So for each combination of x and m, we have different dynamics. The Hamiltonian equations of motion are expressed as a pair of simple ordinary differential equations. They may look intimidating at first, but all they really say is that the position changes according to the momentum, and the momentum changes according to the position. With this setup, and by applying the chain rule of differentiation, we can show that the system conserves total energy. Let's see a simple example. Suppose f of x is the PDF of a normal Gaussian. This means that the negative log of f of x is equal to half of x squared plus some constant that for simplicity we are going to ignore. 
Suppose we take the kinetic energy function to be equal to half m squared. This k function is actually, and up to the mass constant, the real world kinetic energy formula. In the physical world, we also have to take the mass into account, and here it's assumed to be 1. So given these forms, the Hamiltonian will be equal to this, plus a constant that we're ignoring. And we see that if we apply the Hamiltonian equations, we get that dx dt is equal to m, and dm dt is equal to negative x. Even without solving these equations, we can see that the Hamiltonian defines a circle in the xm plane. This means the dynamics trace out circular motion in the joint space of position and momentum, also known as phase space. Here's what this phase space looks like. The small arrows represent the vector field at each point, that is the direction given by dx dt and dm dt. Each one of the three circles are separate solutions based on different initial conditions, hence different energy levels. Bigger circles correspond to higher energy. In this animation, we can see how the ball's motion on the left corresponds to its trajectory in phase space on the right. When x is equal zero, the potential energy is at its minimum, while the momentum, and thus the kinetic energy, is at its maximum. At the extreme positions on either side, the momentum drops to zero and then flips sign. Negative momentum pulls the ball to the left, while positive momentum pushes it to the right. In the simple example I just gave, we have an analytical solution. But in practice, we rarely rely on analytical solutions. Instead, we use numerical methods. One of the simplest is the Euler method. At each step, we compute the gradient vector at the current position, and then take a small step epsilon in that direction. A more accurate alternative is the leapfrog method. Here we take a half step in one variable, then update the other variable using that half step. And finally, complete the step with another half step of the first variable. When leapfrog steps are chained together, only the very first and last momentum updates remain half steps. All the intermediate ones combine into full steps because each new half step stacks with the previous one. The fourth step is to apply the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. To do this, we don't just consider the distribution of x, but the joint distribution of both x and m. The idea is to create a dual connection between phase space and probability space. A trajectory of constant energy in phase space corresponds to a region of constant probability in probability space. One way to establish this link is through the Boltzmann distribution, where probability is proportional to the exponential of negative energy. In other words, lower energy corresponds to higher probability. Since the potential part of the Hamiltonian comes directly from the negative log of f of x, f of x is already tied to this probability. What the Boltzmann relation adds is that the distribution of m defines the kinetic energy term, and conversely, the choice of kinetic energy determines the distribution of m. Let's see how this plays out. Because we chose a simple additive Hamiltonian, the target distribution and the momentum distribution are independent. If we define the joint probability in terms of the Hamiltonian and expand it, we get this expression. We recognize the first term as the normalized target distribution. The second term defines the distribution of m. With our choice of kinetic energy, this corresponds to a Gaussian distribution. And the relationship works in both directions. More advanced versions of the algorithm can use different momentum distributions, but we won't go into those in this video. Here's the full algorithm. Starting at a random position x0, and for as many sample as you'd like, we sample m from the kinetic distribution g. Then we solve the dynamics in phase space by taking l small epsilon steps using the leapfrog method. Then we draw u from a standard uniform distribution. We compare u to the acceptance probability, which is the ratio of the unnormalized joint distribution at the new point versus the old point. If u is below this ratio, we accept the new point. Otherwise, we stay at the old point. Strictly speaking, we also need to flip the sign of the new momentum. I'll explain why in a moment. But since the momentum variables are discarded anyway, this step is optional. Now, in theory, because the leapfrog steps move us along a trajectory of constant energy, the new point should have exactly the same energy, and therefore the same probability, as the old point. That would mean the acceptance ratio is always 1, so every proposal gets accepted. In practice, however, numerical errors accumulate 
and the energy may drift slightly. This is why we still compute the ratio and compare it against U. Notice that the acceptance ratio is equal to the unnormalized Boltzmann distribution of the difference in energy levels. Here you can see how the algorithm looks like in the phase space. We start at some position, take L small steps, usually accept the new point, then we sample a new momentum and continue. If we do this for a long time, we get a lot of points and we can see that they do resemble a normal distribution, which is the target distribution of this example. Now let's sketch a hand wavy argument for why this method actually produces samples from the target distribution. What we need to show is that the joint distribution is stationary and that the chain is ergodic, meaning that samples from a single long run represents the true distribution. We'll first show detailed balance. Starting from the current state, we multiply the probability of proposing a new state through our dynamics by the probability of accepting it and show that this is equal to the corresponding probability of moving in the reverse direction. This proposal probability, which we'll call phi, simplifies to one when we use fixed L and epsilon. Remember that we always flip the momentum at the end. This flip is crucial for ensuring symmetry between forward and reverse moves. We can also randomize L and epsilon by sampling them from a distribution. If done properly, the phi terms remain symmetric and detailed balance still holds. If the phi's are equal to one, we can remove them and then detailed balance becomes very simple. And to show it, we just insert the outside term into the min operator and then reverse the process. If there is some randomness in the phi's, as long as it's symmetric, we can also incorporate it into the detailed balance. Now I want to explain why we need the flipping of the m variable. If we do flip, we get that the process is reversible, meaning starting from the new point, we get to the old point. If we don't flip, we get that the process is not reversible, and we don't get from the new point to the old point. Now let's build some intuition for why this chain is ergodic. Again, this isn't a rigorous proof, just a hand wavy argument. Irreducibility. As long as the momentum distribution G is irreducible, we can sample all kinds of nudges. That means we can, in principle, explore the entire state space by chaining together different moves. Aperiodicity. One way to get this is through rejections. If a proposal is rejected, we stay at the same point. But even in the idealized case where all proposals are accepted, randomizing the integration time breaks periodicity. For example, Suppose we reach some blue point in one step with integration time t. If there's also a chance we reach the same point using two steps of half t, then we have return times of two consecutive numbers, and ignoring how many steps it took to get from the blue point to the yellow point. Since their greatest common divisor is one, the chain is aperiodic. Also, in some simple cases, the dynamic trajectory are closed loops, and then we have the possibility of returning to the same point in one step. This might not always be the case, though. Positive recurrence. The potential energy keeps the dynamics confined to regions where f of x is non-negligible. In other words, the system can't drift to infinity, but is pulled back towards the target distribution, ensuring recurrence. Taken together, these properties give us the intuition that the chain is indeed ergodic. Now you might be wondering, where does the gradient come into play? It comes from the potential energy when we are solving the dynamics of the system. Most of the momentum nudges we sample will lead to small movements, keeping the ball within certain valleys. That means we spend more time sampling near the bottoms of these valleys, regions of high probability. But the dynamics still give us a chance to escape and explore other areas of the distribution. The key advantage of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is that it allows us to make large moves in X by sampling higher momenta, while still accepting almost all of the proposed points. The trade-off is that solving the dynamics requires more computation. That is, the leapfrog step is also costly. Well, that's all for this video. See you in the next one.